So everybody knows all guests on Zaslow Show 2.0 are brought to us by the official beer of the program. That, of course, is Johnny Cuba, European roots of the Caribbean soul, a refreshing German lager in a can. Hey, look, there's no Marlins baseball tonight, all right? They're off tonight. It's Monday, so maybe you just want to relax outside next to your pool with a six-pack of Johnny Cuba. Pick up at Sedano's, Presidente, Winn-Dixie, Fresco y Moss. Remember, you always want to drink responsibly, and don't forget Johnny Cuba's mantra. Stay tranquilo. And joining us here, of course, is our friend Jessica Blaylock, Bally Sports. As like I mentioned, you got the Marlins who are off until tomorrow. They're in Boston, Fenway Park, Red Sox. And Jessica has been uh, uh, neck deep in in the Marlins uh, during this entire run here, so much so that I felt bad for her. Because she she didn't she wasn't able to be at the Stanley Cup Finals games because she's working the Marlins. Uh, I, I want to hear Jess. How did you experience? First of all, I woke up this morning really missing the Panthers. Yeah, uh, I like. I, I, I guess the good part is the NHL in general has the shortest off season, and then when you make it to the Stanley Cup Final, I guess it's even shorter. So that's good. Uh, I really missed the Panthers when I woke up this morning. It was on my mind. But I want to know how was it working. The Marlins games, you got to pay attention. I know you're, you're, you know, in the camera well doing your job, but the Panthers are in Stanley Cup finals. Like, how, were you keeping track? How were you balancing this? Honestly, I've got to imagine it's like a parent when you have multiple children who have activities on the same night and you're trying to figure out which one you are going to attend or prioritize or pay attention to. Um, because I, I, I mean, you know me, I, I so passionately love the teams that I get to cover. And um, I think maybe it was just a good reminder of, of being grateful that you're covering the Marlins right now who are playing such fun baseball and who are having just a really fun season to be a part of so far. Um, and then at the same time, being so proud of the Panthers and how deep they went in their playoff run especially considering some of the teams that they they had to go through to get there. And, and obviously what was revealed afterwards, some of the injuries yeah. that they were battling through. Uh, but it was just one of those, it was one of those times where, yeah, it's, it's certainly hard, you know, to, to not be around some of the biggest games that the, the franchise has seen in decades, but uh, super grateful for the games that I did get to be a part of and super grateful that I got to be on the road with the Marlins during some really fun series wins and, and also enjoying uh, just how much fun baseball season has been as well. So yeah. I think that's the biggest thing is just always come back to that mindset and that place of just being grateful for, for all of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I miss them so much. I, I can't wait for next season to start. I know. <laughs> it was so great. And, and obviously, like, you know, I wanted to, I wanted them to win the Stanley Cup so bad. But, man, like, this, this postseason gave me so many memories that I'm never yeah. going to forget. I mean, they were 7-0 and in overtime in the postseason, which means there were seven occasions where all of a sudden I'm jumping around the room. <laughs> And that doesn't even count the best one, which was Kachuk scoring with 4.3 seconds remaining in game four against Carolina to go to the Stanley Cup final. Yeah. Like, you know, because that wasn't even overtime. So it, it, the fact that we don't have just, hey, remember 1996, like we don't have to do that anymore. You know, it was it was so amazing. I, like, yeah, I wanted to win the Stanley Cup, but I still had it was still I have no hard feelings, you know. And the first win ever in a Stanley yeah. Cup final. For the yeah. Panthers. And that, it was on home ice. And, yeah. and Panther fans got to enjoy that. You know, obviously a tough ending. Um, no, no, the Stanley Cup final win. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. It was game three. That's right. I'm thinking about yeah. the, the Yes, game three, of course. Sorry. Yeah. So so I was super happy for fans that they got a taste of, of just winning a Stanley Cup final game and, and getting to experience that on home ice. Um, yeah. But, yeah, you know, obviously tough, tough ending. Um because you want to see them hoist the cup, but I will always look back on this with nothing but pride yeah. being so proud of this team. There yeah. is absolutely no disappointment for me in any way, shape or form when it comes to this team, 
how hard they fought, not only in the playoffs, but how hard they fought down the finals, you know, couple months of the regular season, what they had to do from January on just to even get themselves into a position to possibly get into the playoffs. So um, I think the future is so bright in Bill Zito. I trust Matthew Kachuk total game changer going to be here for years to come. Um, yeah. I mean, if, if you are, when you think of Panthers hockey, you should be nothing but excited yeah. and, and like that counting down the days to the start of next season. Yeah. So I want to talk about the Marlins with you because usually when we get to this point in the summertime, it's like, all right, can the Marlins hold me over until, you know, late July when training camps are starting for the Dolphins? That's not the case this year. Like, we actually have games to watch that feel that are important. Like, they're, they're meaningful. This game is fun. Yeah. This game is so much fun. Yeah, like, it's we got meaningful games here. And, and it's a shock to me because I had zero ex- – I had extremely low expectation for this Marlins team – I didn't know how they were going to score runs. Certainly didn't, you know, think there's no reason to believe Luis Arias was going to hit 400. But, I mean, it's it's the pitching, right? And we're coming off of last of yesterday afternoon where Yuri Perez, I, I guess, has inserted himself into the Rookie of the Year conversation, right? Because uh, the pitching on this team has been fantastic, right? Yeah, well, I think a big part of it is pitching for sure. But what's crazy is at the beginning of the season – the pitching really wasn't on track. Starters were not going very deep into the game. You know, guys were looking to kind of, of to kind of get going. The bullpen was really taking on a, a lot of innings. And there were definitely games where the offense did help out the pitching. I mean, not only Luis Arise hitting 400 at this point of the season, which is crazy, but Jorge Soler having a resurgence when it comes to his uh career and his power numbers you know he's top five in the league in home runs um so I think guys like Brian De La Cruz uh who have stepped up at different points in the season Jesus Sanchez got hot um for a stretch you know Garrett Cooper has come up with some big swings Jonathan Davis over the past couple of weeks has not only been great defensively but he's come up with a couple of games where he's had some some massive offensive contributions um and now we are seeing the pitching staff overall kind of be what we expected. I know Sandy is still going through some struggles, but I just I've seen Sandy be so good so many times to to still believe that at some point he's going to figure it out. He's going to get on track too. Um, but yeah, Jesus Lazardo has been amazing. Braxton Garrett, can we talk about Braxton Garrett and how good he's been? Uh, Yuri Perez, who for being 20 years old has been so consistent, so much fun and give Sandy credit for Yuri as well, because Sandy from day one has taken Yuri under his wing. Uh, he has been such a mentor. He's been such an encouragement. They go through Yuri starts together. So maybe the numbers aren't there for Sandy, but do not underestimate what Sandy still means as a leader to that staff. Um, So you're kind of seeing a lot of different things work. And when maybe pitching hasn't been great, the offense, which we haven't always seen in the past, has come through and found a way to come up with a big hit. And when the offense maybe isn't going one night and they only score two runs like they did yesterday, pitching, the starting pitching and the bullpen, give the bullpen credit too. Tanner Scott, Stephen Oakert, Andrew Nardi. AJ Puck's been great as a close. So like, there's just so many different things that are working at different times um, that are creating success for this team. And, and Skip Schumacher, awesome. And what do we like about that, him? What do we like awesome. about the manager? I really like that Skip has brought, first off, just a fresh energy and perspective and a new voice and... I think, you know, what I always say about Skip is he's young enough to where he's not that far removed from the game to know what these guys are going through and to be able to relate to them. But he is, on the the other hand, like far enough away from being a player that he can still be a 
like an authority figure, if that makes sense. Like when he needs to step into that role, I think he trusts his coaches rather than tries to micromanage every aspect of the game because he understands that he's still learning as a first year manager as well. So I think there's just a really healthy environment where guys feel like they can be themselves as players, but still have a wonderful coaching staff that they can come to when they need guidance and they can, they need advice and they, I don't know. I love Brant Brown, the hitting coach. I could literally sit for hours and listen to him talk about hitting. Mel obviously is amazing and has been there for, you know, multiple years. Um, I can listen to Mel talk for hours about pitching. And I just think there's just like a really, really good balance of, of just creating a very healthy, welcoming, comfortable clubhouse and an environment for everybody. And it's been, it's been awesome. It's been so much fun. I'm looking at, you know, they just won three out of four against Pittsburgh. And I'm looking at the Marlins record at Lone Depot Park this year. They have like the second best home record in all of baseball. Yeah. yeah. Like that's kind of wild. And so I saw the crowds this week. I mean, I know, I think it was Saturday where, you know, what was it? Was it uh, uh Puerto Rican, Rican Heritage? Heritage? Yep. Okay, so I understand you're going to get a major Puerto Rican crowd on Saturday, but it looked like there was a lot of people there yesterday too. So yeah. is this going to start to be a little bit of a trend or was this just quirky this weekend because you had Puerto Rican Heritage Day? I mean, the Heritage Nights are always really popular and they always draw a larger crowd than we would normally see. But I, it's one thing Rod Allen and I talked about yesterday because we did reference the crowd again. And Rod was like, you know, I think some people from Saturday night came back for Sunday because they had so much fun. And I do hope it becomes a consistent thing because this team is really fun. It's an awesome group of guys. And you're seeing some really special things right now. The fact that Luisa Rise is batting 400 is insane. Mm-hmm. You need to see that in person. The fact that Yuri Perez is pitching the way that he's pitching is insane. You need to see that in person. Well, and you all the what? and all the walk off wins, like including on Saturday, and it's kind of like you know when they walked it off on Saturday, and and, and I was kind of all right. Is something uh something weird's happening here. Is <laughs> is what's going on. Like, it feels like one of those kind of deals. All right, something, there's, there's something going on with this team right now. Yeah, no, without a doubt. And I mean, look, like even Saturday night, look at who the walk-off hero was, John Birdie, you know, another guy who is probably not a household name around major league baseball, but who has for years now always stepped in and stepped up when the Marlins needed him. The number of positions that he's played, he led the league in stolen bases last year, you know, like he just consistently grinds out at bats. Like, and, and I think that's kind of, it's, it's, it's the identity of this team, right? Like that, that guy, John Birdie kind of perfectly encapsulates the identity of this team where it's not necessarily a lot of quote unquote star power names right like Juan Soto or Acuna or Freeman or Betts or whatever it is but it's just guys who work so hard and who have each other's back and who pick each other up night in and night out and that's what makes it so special it looks cool you know even when it's just the lower level filled it looks packed when the lower level is filled and I I have I mean I know I've, I've, I've been to games where it's been decent crowds that building gets really loud, even when it's just the lower level that's filled. Well, it makes a huge difference. And and Skip talked about that in his post game on Saturday night, how you feel that as mm-hmm. a manager, you feel that as a player. And, you know, when you're coming back from a long road trip and you're tired and you need that little extra boost, you really do get that from a, a rowdy, packed yeah. home crowd and I think there were almost 25,000 people there on Saturday night yeah. and maybe not quite that many on Sunday but still an awesome crowd and mm-hmm. we even felt it on the desk for a pregame and postgame show that extra energy that extra buzz 
and it makes a difference. So I, I really, it made me so happy to see people there. Um, and I hope that trend continues because I really, really believe this, this team deserves it. They deserve, they deserve the support. Now, I don't think the team has mentioned anything, but I think we're under the impression that Jazz is going to return tomorrow, right? So they have not mentioned anything official. I know that he's been playing in rehab games that, you know, it seems like it has gone well. So there is a possibility that we could see Jazz return sooner rather than later, for sure. I think did did he put on his did he put on his IG that he's in Boston? I think he did. He might have. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. So I, I think, again, from what everybody has kind of been talking about, um, and I don't want to speak for the team unless there's been an official announcement, but from everything that has been speculated, it does seem like that's the plan. You know, I mentioned this with Tommy Hutton last week where, you know, in, in the past two years and especially last year, and, you know, Jazz is on the cover of MLB 2K, and it's like, Jazz is awesome. He's the Marlins best player. I'm like, Look, a fine player, but here's the thing. If Jazz is your best player, your team sucks, all right? And you looked at the Marlins last year. Jazz was their best player, and the team stunk. And so now they're going to add Jazz into this lineup, and it's like, okay, you got some other nice players on this team now. Jazz doesn't have to be their best player. Go out there, be Jazz Chisholm that you've been the last couple years, and that's a nice piece to add to this team. Yeah. And I think that's probably the most important point. Like you just said, not one guy has to be your best player. Right. And, and what a difference that makes in your lineup too, when you're not just relying on one guy Mm -hmm. to have to get the job done, you look at your lineup and you know, okay, Luis arrives leading off great contact hitter. He's got a good chance of getting on base. Jorge Soler right after him, which also makes them have to pitch to Luis arise. Uh, because guys finally have protection in the lineup as well. Jorge Soler, power threat. You know, you got a good chance to maybe knock him in with a home run or an extra base hit. Okay, and then after that, you got Brian De La Cruz, who's also got power. Uh, you've got Garrett Cooper, who's a, a good combination of a, a contact hitter that can just put the ball in play and also can hit for power. Jesus Sanchez, who's now a lefty bat that you have to deal with, who when he's really shooting for pull side, he's having a lot of success. You know, like... You can't just say, oh, well, if Luis Arise doesn't get on base, what are we going to do? If Soler doesn't hit a home run, what are we going to do? Like, even the bottom of the order has been really, really good. So I think that's also a big thing is when Jazz comes back, he doesn't have to be the guy. You know, everybody in some way, shape, or form has been the guy at some point this season. And that's got to – that's just mentally – for these players has to take a load off to know, Hey, if I don't get a hit, if I don't get on base, you know what? The guy behind me is going to pick me up. And I think that's, that probably makes a big difference too. The Marlins are in Fenway tomorrow. Where does Fenway rank for you as far no. as ball? That's that's no. number, now I know you're not going to be on this trip uh, and you're not going to be at Fenway with them, but that's number one for you. Oh, hands down. And I mean, for multiple reasons, Number one, my dad is originally from Boston, so I grew up in a hardcore Red Sox household. Um, It was one of the first ballparks I ever went to, really, really as a fan, watching a game. Um, And I thought it was the most magical thing of all time. Like, completely lives up to the hype. Have you ever sat in one of the seats where you have the pole in between your legs? (laughs) I have not. I have not. Crazy. Clearly, like I've sat under, uh, like right behind home plate, obviously like sat in the camera well when I work games there, sat up on the monster. I mean, I've gone, I've gone to Fenway more as just a baseball fan than I have as a baseball reporter. Um, but I, I mean, I love the city of Boston. I think Boston's amazing. So for me, Fenway is hands down number one. I remember getting a tour many years ago of Fenway. And, you know, they let you, they take you around and you see one of those seats that literally has a pole in between your legs when you sit down. And I said to the guy, I go, I go, somebody sits here and goes, that's someone's season ticket. Yeah. (laughs) Amazing. Amazing. Literally a pole in between your legs. I just love thinking about the fact that you're sitting in a seat where someone 
sat a hundred years ago yeah. and watched a game. Yeah. How like, I just think that's the coolest thing. So yeah, for me, Fenway, hands down, number one. Marlins are fun right now. Like I said, normally we get to this time of year and it's, Hey, how many more days until training camp for the dolphins? But the, the Marlins are doing their job. Uh, and it feels to me, I mean, listen, I know they made the postseason in 2020. Uh, and I know they even won a series in that postseason. But it was a kooky year. It was 60 games. It's not the same thing when you've got the grind, the 162 games. I'd like to, you know, have a season like 20 years ago where yeah. we experienced the entire season and and make the postseason. So hopefully this, this is one of those years. Um, I do want to ask you, though, about something that you've you've talked about on social media recently. And, and I know something that obviously made you very, very upset. And it's something that's important to me as well. You uh, you, you have you have chihuahuas, you have you have multiple dogs and you you adopted, you rescued one a couple of weeks ago. And it's one of those situations based on what you posted where the dog. You, you, you never really know with, you know, the rescues, you never really know what the dog had been through, but you knew it was something not good. Same thing with my guy. I, I got two dogs. We rescued my second one who we've had for about a, uh, about 15, 16 months now. And he was in terrible shape when we rescued him. He's six years old now. Who knows what kind of abuse there was. There definitely was something going on there and he's come such a long way. So amazing now um so the rescue is is that kind of stuff super important to me and i know that your dog that you rescued passed away shortly after you got him so uh i wanted you to just talk a little bit about you know for folks out there who who are interested in getting dogs like you should look look to these rescues i i, yeah. I love the rescues because you kind of get you get almost like news and notes on the dog because all these rescues they're in fosters before they allow the dog to be adopted. And the foster essentially, you know, gives you like notes on the dog, its behavior and what works and what doesn't and what it likes and what it doesn't like. And it really helps, you know, for, you know, when you get a new dog. So uh, I, I just I just wanted to let you talk a little bit about, you know, what 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 you went through and and how cool it is you know, to, to rescue a dog as opposed to look the dogs that need to be bought. Uh, I'm not all, Hey, don't ever buy. I'm not, I'm not all crazy about, you know, don't ever buy uh you know, uh, adopt, don't shop. But, but I, I do lean toward rescuing being the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing is, is I understand that there are certain breeds that people love that you're yeah. just never gonna find in a rescue. I get that. But on the other hand, there are so many animals, so many animals in shelters and yeah. homes. And I am a big time, you know me, I'm a softie. I'm a big time nurturer. I, I have just always been that way. And I, I am very passionate about loving things that need to be loved. And, and, um, and I'm also very passionate about thinking that if you are a person who would ever hurt an animal or a child, uh, you are, the lowest of the low. You are human garbage if you would ever hurt an animal or a child. It's such a weird thing, right? Like, like my dog who we rescued, Shaggy. He's a he's a cocker spaniel. He's, we think he's six years old. Um, we know he he went through some shit for sure, and yeah. and and it makes me it makes me mad, you know, when I think about oh, what what he went through and the way he was abandoned and the way that they found him. It makes me really mad. But at the because I love him so much. And, but at the same time, you know, there's a part of it where like, I'm glad because now I know I, I, I'm going to take care of him and love him for the rest of his life. And he's in great shape and I wouldn't have him otherwise. So it's, it's a really weird dynamic, but, but that ultimately makes me really angry when I think about it. Oh, for sure. For sure. If I ever saw, I, like, I'm not a violent person by nature, but if I ever saw someone hurting a child or an animal, oh, mama's jumping in like hardcore. Um, but yeah, so just uh, just the rescuing and, and the passion for for rescuing. Um, yeah, it's it's an opportunity for redemption, right? And it's an opportunity to love something that maybe previously had never had the opportunity to be loved. Um, and so that was probably the hardest thing with with Rosie is uh, so sh she was found on the streets of Miami and the rescue thought she had probably been used excessively for breeding. And when they were done with her, they dumped her 
as if she meant nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had surgery to help with some of the things that, you know, she had been dealing with. Um, and, and I just think it was too much for her. And I think the hardest part is she had just never had really the chance to be loved. And then when she finally got the chance, you know, she just, I, I wish she had had more of an opportunity to really experience love before her time came to an end. But you gave it those days, you know, those final yeah. days, you, you, you did it, you did a yes. real uh, mitzvah there. Yes. And, and that's the thing that you try to take comfort in is knowing that, you know, at least she knew love at the end. And, yeah. and she passed in my arms versus maybe on the street alone by mm -hmm. herself. Yep. Um, it, so yeah, that's kind of the hardest part, but you, you don't let the fear of a broken heart and, and knowing you might have to go through that again, ever stop you from continuing to give love. So, I mean, I have Lennon who I've had for years, there who is, is. The, the, the OG, you she know, almost bit Minervini a couple years ago. She did. And that's why a lot of people love her. And then this is one of my newest little guys. This is Mario. Yes. And see, look at his little tongue. Yes, look at him. <laughs> look at the tongue. Yes. Mr. Mario was found, uh, again, on the streets of Miami, sunburned and emaciated and too weak to stand. So he was rescued, and I just got him a couple days ago as well. And for the rest of his life, he will know nothing but love and snuggles and a full belly and a warm bed to sleep in. So... This is why we do what we do, right, Zaz? Like, this is yeah. why we support animal rescues. This is why we adopt dogs that maybe have had rough lives previously is because now we get to love them back to life. And that this to me is is infinitely worth whatever potential heartache I may have to go through down the road to know that, hey, you know what? However much time we still have together, it's going to be it's going to be amazing and, and well worth it. There's so many great dogs out there, be it at, you know, the Humane Society or at a rescue. Uh, like I said, I, I prefer the rescues. I like the rescues because, you know, they, they go through a, a foster process. So you, you really get to learn a little bit about the dog before it gets to you. And the rescues that they're so, they really, they, they really, there's a whole process where they're really making sure the dogs go to the right place. Yeah. And, and I really highly recommend, you know, when it comes, like I said, my dog Shaggy, he's our second one in the house. Uh, our first, our, our, the other one is, is Bailey. And we, we got him, um, we got him from a breeder. I mean, it's all up and up the breeder situation. Yeah. We got him as a puppy. And uh, I, I, at least the way that I feel about it, I think if you're looking to add a dog, if you're looking for a second dog, I think rescue is such a good way to go because yeah. number one, you don't necessarily want to go through that puppy phase again which can be very difficult for a family. The puppy phase is hard. It really is. It takes a lot of work. Uh, but also, I think going to the rescue for the second dog, or if you've had a dog previously, I think knowing what you're doing with the rescue is very, very important because they've been through a lot, these dogs. And if you're a new, a brand new dog owner, it may, it may be very difficult to adapt. I think if you're... Uh, if you're a previous dog owner, if you have experience, I think the rescue is such a great way to go. Yeah. And I think the other thing is too, like dogs like this, it's not their fault. Like they pay the price for humans being irresponsible, you know? And I think that's like, I think that's probably the other part of it too, is I, to give an animal an opportunity Again, like just coming back to that word redemption, you know, like their circumstances are not their fault. They're, if they're overbred, it's not their fault. It was because humans made terrible decisions. And so often like they're in the shape they're in because of the way that humans treated them. So I think it's just, it's wonderful and so gratifying to be able to always bring it back to love, you know, to always bring it back to, okay, well, now you have an opportunity to experience love. Now you have an opportunity to experience what life should have really looked like for you from the beginning. So um, yeah, I'll always gravitate towards rescues. I'll always gravitate towards wanting to give an animal a new lease on life who maybe would not have had that chance before. Um, and I, I, 
I'm with you. I will always, always passionately, passionately support animal rescues. Um, so, and I think anything, anything that benefits children or anything that benefits animals, it's just the most wonderful thing that you can contribute towards. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. I love that you gave me the opportunity to talk about this. Mention the rescue that you, uh, that you got, uh, your girl right there or your boy right there from. Yes. So, uh, two different rescues. Um, the one that had Rosie, uh, was I Heart Animal Rescue and, and they are awesome because they do not take a single penny for themselves. It literally all goes to the animals. One of the ladies just took a dog in and, and put $2,000 of it on her own credit card. So I Heart Animal Rescue, it's a local one in Fort Lauderdale. I have it linked on my Instagram if you would like to make a donation. Um, and then Mario came from Glimmer of Life. So uh, yeah, any any animal rescue though, good way to go. But and, I'll, heard- and I'll mention here, and I'll mention here uh, where we got Shaggy from yeah, uh, is uh, Paw Patrol Animal Rescue and Sanctuary. Uh, so and you could find them uh, all over Facebook as well. And that's really how we found him. Like you see a lot of these. I don't mean ads, but you see like it pops up on Facebook and you could see the dogs that they have, you know, up yeah. to rescue, you know, and you could read a little bit about them because they're in a fall storm. Like, and I, I think I like that guy. Let's go meet yeah. him, you know, and that that's how we that's how I know. We I saw him. I saw Mario's picture and it was the tongue for me. Like, and I mean, yeah. just come on one more time. Can we look yeah. at this adorable face? <laughs> and that tongue, like, I yeah. can't. I literally can't. <laughs> uh, real quick here before we let you go, Jess, what are what are we watching on on TV these days? Have you finished Netflix? What what are you watching? What am I watching right now? Um, I'm still working on finishing Modern Family. I think I'm in the last season of Modern Family. Um, really, just been watching a lot of baseball lately. Obviously, uh, and then I just actually um, a mutual friend from college. Got her own show on HGTV. Uh, her name's Gailey Alex, and it's called Home and Heartbeat. And okay. she designs and decorates um, homes right here in Fort Lauderdale, which I think was really cool because you see things and you're like, oh, I know exactly where that is. Oh, I okay. can go to that store. So um, just finished watching the whole season of that as well. All right. And movies on the plane rides with road trips? What? Mo- okay, so I just watched a brand new movie i'd ne- well it's not a brand new movie it actually came out years ago but it's a movie i'd never seen um secret window with johnny depp have you ever heard of that yeah i know what that is yeah it was yeah. based on a stephen king yeah like short story and i obsessively love stephen king um so i just watched that pretty good i've not seen bad. that yeah yeah um so yeah that's probably and i i downloaded the star wars trilogy because we were going out west so the plane ride to seattle uh i i rewatched which Star trilogy then like which episodes oh well the original ones from like four five and six yeah four five and six okay. yeah a new hope empire strikes strikes back and return of the jedi there you go All now right. i got myself, now i gotta get myself like mentally ready for indiana jones dial of destiny oh how good is that trailer look i'm so excited But like Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Okay, so I like obsessively love, if I could watch any trilogy for the rest of my life, it would be Indiana Jones. Like I, growing up, like watched Indiana Jones and not just Raiders. Like I love Temple of Doom. Oh, I watched Temple of the Doom so many times as a kid. I love Temple of Doom. So many times. I not like it. It's amazing. It's a great movie. Last Crusade is my all-time favorite. Like Last Crusade is amazing. So... I was so mad though when I left the theater after seeing Kingdom of the Crystal School because I did not like it like at all. Like, is that the one? Crystal. Now I didn't see that one. Is that the one with Shia LaBeouf? Yes. It's no good. I didn't like it. It has very slightly grown on me in recent years. I've rewatched it multiple times. Uh, I still like do not include it at okay. all when all I right. refer to Indiana Jones. So I'm going into, I feel like I'm going to go into Dial of Destiny with really low expectations. That's okay. That I'm going to be super angry when I leave the theater. And maybe I'll actually end up liking it. I'm very excited. I saw a trailer for it this weekend in the theater. And I was, I was very like, oh my God, I have goosebumps. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. 
excellent job, Jess. Uh, thank you a lot for coming on the show, of course, and uh, safe travels. We'll we'll be watching you on TV real soon. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me.